Hello there, Eric here, and we're going to talk a little bit about digital citizenship. What is it? What makes up digital citizenship, and why is it important to you? Why should it be important to you? I'm going to talk a little bit about that more and touch a little bit about the nine elements that make up this idea of digital citizenship. So, who is a citizen? Well, citizen is defined in a couple of different ways, but basically two different ideas are uh, represented here. A citizen of a country is a naturalized citizen. Um, I'm American. I have an American passport. Therefore, I'm an American citizen. But you can also think of a citizen as a particular responsible entity or individual in a town or any area. Someone that pays taxes and is a part of the community. So in that sense, I am a citizen of Kyoto Prefecture. What is digital? So we're talking about digital citizenship. Well, digital comes from an idea uh, expressed in digits. And computers talk in digits, zeros and one, basically on and off. And we've come up with great ways to use this simple binary language of on and off to help us program computers. So we put these together and we get this idea here. This clock, this watch on the left hand side is a digital watch. It has switches on off and it, the time is set in increments. The watch here on the right is an analog clock. It's not digital. And uh, it really doesn't count in increments. It goes in uh, complete and uh, sort of like analog circles. So we have a digital citizen. Let's put those together. What do you think a digital citizen is? So a citizen, someone, responsible person in the community. Digital meaning ones and zeros, computerized. So put those together. A digital citizen refers to a person that uses technology, mainly information technology, in order to engage the world, to be a good citizen of the world, to engage in politics and society and government. We're going to use the internet, use computers, use technology in responsible ways to help our community. So being a digital citizen is sort of like being a responsible citizen that uses the, the latest, not even necessarily the latest technology, but some sort of technology and uses the internet to help us help our community. So let's talk about the nine elements of digital citizenship. I'm going to talk briefly the definition I'll give you a very quick example, and then I'll talk about some key terms, some key vocabulary for each of the nine elements. And you can choose what you think are the most important terms, the most important elements to you. Okay, so the first one here is digital access. Not everyone has the same access to technology. Did you know that most people in the world don't even know what the internet is or don't even have access to the internet. It's kind of crazy to think about it because if I took your internet away, I don't know how long you would survive before going crazy. Here's an example in India of children using internet for the first time. So you can see a lot of these, uh, especially poorer regions of the world, have no idea what the internet is and how this vast amount of information is there to help them. And this is what makes something called the digital divide. And the digital divide is what the idea of the technology, the access to technology is dividing us into two separate uh, societies, one that has the internet and one that doesn't have the internet. And the one that does have the internet has decisive advantages by being able to have access to all the information of the world. 
And that goes along with the technology access of it. Next term of digital citizenship, next element is digital commerce. We all found uh, in class that we like to do some online shopping, and this is exactly what it means. It's our ability to conduct business online. And this is a big part of digital citizenship. Uh, a lot of us use credit cards and uh, shop on sites like Amazon or Lacroten. So here we have online shopping and something called identity theft. That's where someone will take the information and pretend they are you and go out and buy things, pretend they're you to get a loan, or pretend they're you to get access to information. So they will they won't steal from you a physical thing, they'll just steal your identity, who you are. And that's pretty dangerous online these days. Okay, next, digital communication. This is one of the things that we're talking a lot in this classroom because uh, the internet and a lot of communication today is giving us great tools into helping us communicate with each other. Without Skype and those types of internet tools, I would have a hard time keeping up with my family back in America living in Japan. So before we would write letters, now we just give an ine or a like on a Facebook page, we tweet out some information, or we can put a comment on Facebook, and the way we communicating is turning very different. For example, before we used to call, now we just write a text, very short, do it when we want, don't answer when we don't want to, we don't have to do it immediately. It's changing the way we think about communicating with each other. So, so a couple of key terms there is texting and cell phone etiquette. When do you use your phone in public? Or when can't you? Next one is digital literacy. Now, everyone might, the first element was access to uh, technology and the internet, but even if you have access to it, you might not be able to use it or use it well. And this is digital literacy. It's your ability to use technology, to use the internet to help you learn, to help you communicate, to help you buy things. It's your ability to use these things for your own benefit. Okay. So one of the big questions we're here is, whose responsibility is it to teach you how to use technology? Should this be taught at school? Or should this be taught by your parents at home or by your friends? Whose responsibility is it to show you how to be safe online, to be able to uh, communicate using Skype to your friends? Is that up to you? Should you learn that by yourself? The key terms for this one is online education. We can now study online, which is a great thing, using online courses, which you're doing right now with this video, and understanding technology, knowing what technology is and what it can do for you. Next element, touched on this just earlier, is called digital etiquette. Now, this is etiquette is a word for basically meaning manners, having good manners. And here in Japan, there is a lot of digital etiquette when using your phone, especially around others. A lot of people in Japan don't use your phone, don't talk on your phone when you're on a busy train or in a bus. In America, we talk whenever we want, basically. But when is it okay to text? If you're talking to a friend, is it okay to pull out your phone and text while you're talking at the same time? Well, those are some questions that go along with this digital etiquette idea. And we can see this type of activity happening a lot, you know, uh, people getting together, not talking, but just looking at their phones. Is this the way we want to communicate? Is this good etiquette? So to put that together, we have internet, etiquette, internet, etiquette, Netiquette. So that's one word put together by internet etiquette, and that's a pretty popular term being thrown around today. And technology etiquette, very similar.
Next element is digital law. The pace of innovation, the pace of technology is going so fast and law is actually having a bit of a hard time keeping up with it. We're trying to be safe, we're trying to create laws to keep each other safe and have fair practices on the internet, but it's not very easy because we keep coming up with these new technologies all the time. So how do we enforce when someone steals your information? How do we uh, detect and whose responsibility is that? For example, someone steals your identity in another country, say, I don't know, China or the Philippines or Brazil, and you live in Poland or England, whose responsibility is it to get your items back, to get your money back? This is all coming down to these hackers, these new style of criminals on the internet, and we're trying to protect ourselves against this. But it doesn't only have to do with criminals on the internet, it just has to do with us being able to conduct a fair and um, equitable system where we can all be treated fairly on the internet. Two very key terms in this, one is copyright law. So on the internet, what can we use and freely use again? What can we use and sell? What can we take and then post again on other websites? For example, it's against copyright law to put uh, music from your favorite band on YouTube. That's, they're trying to sell that information on other their other distribution networks and you are not allowed by copyright law to use that on your own new media communications such as YouTube. Next, we have software privacy. Now, this is very interesting because we all want access to information, but we don't want people to have access to our information. So where do we draw that line? So where do we say, um, it's my privacy, privacy to have my information on my computer, but I want to have access to the information of my employees and what they're doing because I'm paying them in certain situations. Or I want to have access to the information of my uh, government representative, but they want to have my information to be able to represent them. What information and how is that obtained is very uh, on the forefront of this digital law idea. That goes along very closely with the digital rights and responsibilities element, which is the seventh one. And this is what kind of rights do we have? When we're talking about privacy, it's very closely related to that. What rights do you have to privacy on the internet and what rights do you have to access other people's information? This is an example that uh, I had between two very famous people and as a, a, I won't say the names, but we'll, I'll give you a link on the uh, position below. And you can find information where this couple actually were trading pictures back and forth. They thought it was private on the internet and they got out. So everyone's looking at these very private pictures on the internet. And so whose responsibility is it to shut these things down? Uh, people kept reselling them on the internet through various websites. So the key term here is end user agreement. Oops, go back. End user agreement. That is what we all sign into when we look at for example, iTunes, this is a big, long list of laws and agreements we all have to say yes to in order to use particular websites and software. And it's important to know what that end user agreement allows them to use. And sometimes we're actually agreeing for people to take our information, to take our and invade our privacy through this end user agreement. And what kind of rules do we use for technology? Element eight, digital health. Very important. Um, we're using technology more and more. This was always a, uh, a concern even back when I was younger, before the internet, is that we were sitting at home too much and watching TV on the couch. This is even becoming a bigger concern with the internet uh, and uh, things like internet addiction. So one of the things I've noticed recently, especially within my students, is that 
they become very stressful, very uh, heightened anxiety when they don't have access to their phones, which then means they don't have access to the internet and to their friends. And that constant stream of connectedness and in communication with their friends. So, low battery, no Wi-Fi, no cell phone signal equals anxiety and stress. And this can affect our health. And this is not even talking about the actual health concerns that some people associate with having signals connected to our body, having a cell phone that's sending signals, uh, high frequency signals perhaps next to our body. Ergonomics is another key term there. Ergonomics is the study of being comfortable and having your body in the right position when we are using a technology. It's very, uh, a lot of people like to have a standing desk, desk that was popular uh, last year. I don't know if it's gonna be popular again this year, but to have your uh, body situated in the right way and so we don't get things like carpal tunnel and hurt ourselves by using a computer for extended periods of time. And technology addiction. It's getting more and more the case. Um, when we don't have access to the internet, we feel stressed. Um, I personally go into that category. Without the internet in my home, I feel a bit lost. We're relying on technology more and more. We don't remember phone numbers. We don't remember how to get places. We just ask our phone and our navigation system. So without it, we're like missing a part of our brain and therefore highly addicted to that technology. Last one is digital security. And in my recent poll of my students, this came up as the number one important uh, element of digital citizenship, but it's not necessarily the best one. But this has to do with being able to keep your information secure, keep yourself um, from being uh, manipulated, keep your identity from being stolen. And one of the big issues with this is having secure and good passwords. Can someone guess your password? A couple of uh, key terms here. Spyware and adware. When you go on a website and you may have clicked on a wrong thing or two, it will download information to your computer to track what you do. And most of the time this is not serious, they're just trying to get information about your shopping habits and where websites you visit so they can try and sell you things. But sometimes this can be very malicious. They're trying to get passwords or trying to know when you're online and when you're not online so they can sort of use your identity when you're not using it. And backing up, which is probably the most safest and most beneficial thing you can do to keep yourself secure is to back up your data on a separate hard drive or on the cloud. Well, there's issues with that as well. But if you have a backup of your data, um, it can probably save you a lot of headaches in the future. So those were the nine elements of digital citizenship. Sorry, that was a little long. Um, but I'd like you to think about what you think is the most important element of digital citizenship. And within these elements of digital citizenship, um, what elements do you think will become more important as we go towards the future? And which ones do you think will be changing as we move towards the future as well? Because those are all important questions as we move forward and this technology begins to change. If you want to know a little bit more, uh, just look at the description for links and uh, look for more videos on this channel. All right, this is Eric, Together Learning, signing off.